Divine Order On the 29th of September, 1947, in the deep mystery of the divine appearance, during prayer of the winged angel bathed in intense light, word came from God to the Founder. It is the wish of God to send you on an errand of preaching to the world. Many nominal Christians there are who, when confronted by difficulties and problems of this world, they run after fetish priests and other powers of darkness for all kinds of assistance. Consequently, on their death, they cannot see Christ because, by their actions, Satan has left his spiritual mark on them. To assist you in your work so that men may listen and follow you, miraculous works of holy divine healing will be carried out by you in the name of Jesus Christ. These works of divine healing and God's spiritual mark on you will testify to the fact that God sent you. Thus was born the worldwide celestial church of Christ. The name of the church came down from heaven by divine revelation through Mr. Alexander Yanga, who was at that time undergoing spiritual healing at the residence of the pastor founder and who was held in trance for seven days. At the end of the seventh day, he asked for a piece of chalk and wrote the name of the church on the wall. Thus, Eglise du Christianisme Celeste, meaning Celestial Church of Christ. Apart from also being a prophet, the founder was allowed by divine order to use the name E Pastoral in angelic language, which was also translated for him as pastor. This was after he had spent the first five years since the birth of the church as evangelist. He is thus Reverend Pastor Prophet Founder, herein after referred to as pastor, whose unquestionable authority on earth on all matters of the church symbolizes the oneness, unity, and indivisibility of the church. Pastor shall refer not only to the present pastor, but also to his successors in eternity. The final sole authority in the Celestial Church of Christ, Nigeria Diocese, is vested in the pastor, or the person who succeeds him on his death. Whoever is chosen to succeed as pastor should have his headquarters in the land set aside for the pastor in Porto Novo, Republic of Benin. The prophet pastor founder Reverend S.B.J. Oshofa asserts that if he should die in the Republic of Benin, he should be buried in the land he had pointed out in Porto Novo, Republic of Benin. If he should die in Nigeria, he should be buried in the town of Imeko in Egbado Division of Ogun State, near his mother on the family land given to him. The pastor asserts that his burial ground, wherever it is, should be set aside as holy ground and a place of pilgrimage. Foundation History Herewith, the English translation of the history of Celestial Church of Christ, as told by the Reverend Pastor Prophet Founder S.B.J. Oshofa, during evening service on Wednesday, 18th January 1969, at Makoko, Headquarters Church of Celestial Church of Christ, Nigeria Diocese. The history was related in place of the regular sermon for the church service. It is a thing of pleasure that I am still alive today, 21 years and some months after the birth of our church. Right here today at Makoko, the headquarters church of Celestial Church of Christ in Nigeria, I have been asked to give a short history of the church for posterity. But before doing so, I shall start by giving a short history of myself to clarify matters. My father was a Methodist born and bred in Dahomey, now Republic of Benin. His father, Ojo, and his mother, Koshina, came from Abelkuta in Nigeria to Dasatre, where they settled. The artificial boundary between Nigeria and Dahomey set up by Europeans meant that my father was a Dahomeyan. His name was Oshofa. This is obtained from Ojukin Sheofa Tiotalita Bani Kashubu, or for short, Oju Kosofa, which was shortened further to Oshofa, 
in Yoruba language, and it means in English, the human eye is not a missile that an enemy can fire at one to make one fall. He had many wives, each of whom bore him up to five to six children. All the children were, however, female, and only one survived. This made him entreat God according to Methodist doctrine. O Lord, if thou would give me a boy, I shall give him up to thy service, just as Hannah and Elkanah did. As a result, I was born in 1909 in Port Novo of a Nigerian mother named Alake Iyafo from Imeko Ibado Division, Abelkuta Province. I was named Samuel and also Bilewu. Which means, if you prefer to live in this world, then you are welcome. But if you prefer to live above in heaven, then you are equally welcome to go. But I know I specially requested for you from God. In fulfillment of my father's vow to God, I was sent at the age of seven for God's service to a Methodist catechist, Moses Yansunu father of evangelist Nathaniel Yansun of our church. Because my father was not happy with the way I was treated, he brought me back home and later sent me at the age of 13 to stay with Reverend Bishop David Hodonu Loco, the Methodist Bishop of Porto Novo, formerly of Methodist Church, Olowogbowo, Lagos, Nigeria. I was there with some other children, after a number of years, Reverend D. H. Loco was replaced by Bishop Garner from London. The new bishop ordered that we pupils should participate in making blocks for a new college building. We all refused, and so he sent us all back to our parents. When I got back, my father admonished me that I was different from the others, because he had specially requested for me from God, and so I had to do the work. Whereupon... He took me back to the bishop, but the bishop would not reverse his decision. Whereupon my father said there was no alternative, but I should learn to be a carpenter like himself. I became proficient as a carpenter. I was good at roofing buildings, wood planing, and working with ebony, which I bought regularly from a friend. I kept on working happily as a carpenter until my father died on June 15, 1939. After my father's death, I continued to bear the burden until December 1946, when I decided that I would henceforth trade in ebony. I would myself go into the forest to purchase ebony and bring this into the town to sell to carpenters. I began this trade going into the forest areas in search of ebony. I bought it cheaply and brought it to town to sell at a premium. I continued this lucrative trade until one such trip in May 1947 during the floods. As usual, I had my Bible with me. I also loved much to pray. On the 23rd May 1947, the day of the eclipse of the sun, as I was praying in the forest on this trip, I heard a voice and could not open my eyes. The voice I heard was Luli, and the same voice told me, this means the grace of Jesus Christ. When I opened my eyes, I saw a white monkey with two teeth, each top and bottom, with winged hands and feet like those of a bat. When it wants to fly, it flaps its wings forward. But it was stationary. I saw a bird with yellow feet, yellow beak and long tail. It would sometimes fan out its tail like a peacock does. And it was multicolored. It was also stationary. I also saw a short snake, about one foot long. As it stood stationary, it was coiled and its mouth was puffed like a cobra. When I heard this voice, I noticed I felt quite different from my normal self. I now found myself toying with the snake. The bird stood for a time and then went into the bush. The monkey also flew away. I then noticed that there was a complete change in me. I had been rowed to the forest by a canoe paddler I hired from Toffing in Gambia. I always gave him money for his own food, but he stole some of my soup soon after he began to have stomach pains and groaned to my hearing. 
I ran to him inquiring what was the matter. He said all he did was taste some of my soup. I then admonished him that he should not have eaten any of my soup since I gave him money for his own food. I lay my hand on his stomach and the pains left him. He ran away, leaving me alone and saying that he did not wish to stay with this odd man who lives in the forest and whose soup he tastes only to find he has stomach pains, which this odd man removes simply by placing his odd man's hand on his stomach. I was thus left with the canoe, without paddler, and I myself did not know how to paddle. This was precisely why I wandered in the forest for three months. During these three months, I did not cook, and I could not paddle the canoe, but I soon discovered a hole in a tree into which bees flew. I soon made fire by lighting two pieces of dry wood together. I would take a dry leaf, light it, and stick it in the hole at night. Once the bees have run away, the bees' honey was my food. My drinking water was the flowing stream nearby. But there I saw many visions and experienced many changes in me. The forest was so thick that one looked up and saw no skies but trees, snakes, boar, monkeys, and birds singing. In the midst of all this, I prayed a lot. I did not hunger, I felt no fear, and I had no illness but basked in the glory of Jesus Christ. As I wandered about in the forest, I came to a hill lock called Fagbe, after the township of Zinvir, where I met a man who became senior leader Michael, when he subsequently joined Celestial Church of Christ. It was he who told me the name of the village. I saw a lot of children and prayed there. I returned into the forest, wandering round, looking for the canoe, and soon came by a lake called Godro, near which there is a village named Hongon. I continued my wandering past Wedo and on to Alangon until I found the canoe tied up along Ithmus' narrow stream from Alangon well into the forest. Not knowing how to paddle, I got into the canoe and just allowed myself to be carried downstream by the current of the stream, which was then in full flood. While the canoe was thus carried from side to side by the current, Snakes fell from trees into the canoe, but I carried them from the canoe with my hand back into the stream unhurt. I continued my trip down the river and soon got to Agonge. There I found a Methodist young man called Kudio at the point of death, who was reported to have been very ill for a long time. I touched him and Jesus raised him up. He is alive today and so are his children all in Agonge. I now went to collect more ebony wood from the forest. On my return, after five days from the forest, the whole of Agonge was in ferment. What kind of man is this, they said. We will certainly follow him in his church. I told them I did not have a church. They would not listen, and I prayed for them. I stayed with Yesufu in Agonge, who was a neighbor of mine back in Porto Novo. After the miracle of raising Kudiho on the first day of my arrival in Agonge, and before my return from the forest, Yesufu had gone back to Porto Novo to tell my relations that he had seen me at Agonge, that I looked very odd and like a madman, that my hair was long, unkempt, and matted, that even my dress was rough and untidy, and that I touched the dead and they rose up. He did not know what was the matter with me, My relations replied him that the reason for my untidy appearance could not be anything but laziness. I began to prepare to return home to Porto Novo on the fifth day. I engaged Zin Sao as my new paddler. On my return there, all those who had known me before were curious. I began to have crowds of visitors. About three days after my return to Porto Novo, my elder sister Elizabeth Ekundayo came to me to say that her son, Emmanuel Mawio, i.e. Olorundara Guton, had died. I went to him and found native doctors there who had tried unsuccessfully to bring him back to life. When they saw me, they quickly packed out of the room. What the native doctors failed to do, Christ did. For I touched the deceased and he came back to life, all in the name of Jesus Christ.
It was this miracle that made my sister leave UAM, Elijah Church, and follow me. Her son Emmanuel immediately received the holy gift of prophecy and thus became the first prophet of the church. It was through him that a lot of our worship was revealed, such as Pajaspa, the specially designed receptacle for taking collection at services with a candle lit at one end. On the 29th of September, 1947, while I was praying in my house with some visiting friends, I saw a strong ray of light, rather like that from the headlamp of a car. I then saw a winged being whose body was like fire and whose eyes were tiny flying towards me behind the beam of light. As it approached me, the beam of light shortened until the bean stood about a yard from me. This bean then proceeded to say to me, God wishes to send you on an errand of preaching to the world. Many Christians there are who, during their lifetime, when confronted by problems and difficulties of this world, they seek after fetish priests and other powers of darkness for all kinds of assistance. On their death, they think they are Christians, but they are no longer Christians because Satan has left his mark on them. For this reason, such people after death cannot see Christ. God wants to send you to the world on a mission of preaching and exhortation, but the world will not believe you to assist you in your work so that men may listen to and follow you. The miraculous works of holy divine healing will be wrought by you in the name of Jesus Christ. These works of divine healing and God's spiritual mark on you will testify to the fact that God sent you. Immediately after I got this message, Marie, the wife of Frederick Zevenu, one of those present, exclaimed that she saw Jesus. I asked her how. She said she saw a cross made of wood, tall, big and wide. She said he came down from the cross, stretched his hand, and she could see blood oozing out of both left and right hands, where nails had been driven in. She could see the same on the feet and from other parts of the body. She said Jesus then displayed his sides, and she could see where he had been speared, and that Jesus came down from the cross, stood before him, the pastor, and took him, the pastor, into a room. When they both re-emerged, the woman continued. He, the pastor, was dressed in a white tunic full of stars, and the pastor's eyes were so full of blinding light that she could not look at them. But now she continued. She was surprised to find him, the pastor, without the tunic or the blinding light. I also related to her what I had seen and heard. She, her husband, and others all departed. I could not sleep all night. Various heavenly visitors came and spoke with me. At 10 o'clock the following morning, Frederick Zevenu, husband of Marie, a Roman Catholic in Porto Novo, met a group of young people playing Ayo, a game in a quarter in Porto Novo called Jogri. He related to them what had happened in my house the previous day, what I had seen and what his wife had seen as we knelt down to pray. He told them that his wife was at home and had not slept all night, but had been talking all the time and the things she said were rather mysterious and far above her. About twelve of those young people ran to my house in disbelief that such things could still happen. Seven of them were possessed by the Holy Spirit delivering different messages about the tenets of the church and could not move. The remaining five retraced their steps and went back to Zevu in Porto Novo to spread the news. Those who heard them again ran to my place in disbelief that in this day and age such things could happen, but they also experienced some of the things the first lot experienced. This led to gossips throughout Porto Novo that I had commissioned and bought magic. All the churches were bewildered. The Methodist church was shaken to its foundations and alive with gossips that I was dealing with the powers of darkness and so on. When I found that 13 days passed by without my being able to sleep because my house was full of Muslims, Catholics, Methodists, idol worshippers, some 200 of them, I sent word through Dominic Adonde 
on the Friday to the expatriate police officer in charge of the town at the time, that I, whom he must remember as a music player in the town, implore him to dispatch police officers to my house and to drive away all these people in my house because I have not been able to sleep for the past 13 days. Dominic confirmed to him that I was a citizen of the town and he asked to see me. I went to see him and related to him the entire episode. He replied that he had no right to send police officers to drive people out. Rather, since he suspected that God wished to use me for a certain purpose, he would suggest that I arrange an open-air meeting the following Saturday, to which I should invite people all round by means of notices to offices and other forms of publicity. He said that he himself would be there, as his own father was a Christian. He did not have the power to drive away anybody. This reply made me thoroughly fed up with the whole situation. But those who were with me agreed readily to the officer's suggestion, and those among them who were literate went and prepared notices and distributed them throughout Porto Novo. Open Air Meeting On reading these notices, many people who had earlier only just heard rumors now congregated on my premises, anxious to see what would happen. We erected a wooden die on which I sat and with the prophet seated either side of me. I was spiritually guided to open a Bible before me, but not to read it, and to light three candles before me, which I did. Whenever a question was asked, the reply I should give usually came to me from him that sent me. I sat down. The first question was from one man whom we call Alex Agayimi, a member of the cherubim and seraphim church. He was Togolese. Whenever a question was asked, one of my ears gave a high-pitched noise while the other was silent. The noisy ear did not hear what was being asked, while the quiet one did. Alex said he understood that Moses Urimolade was sent by God, and he performed all kinds of spiritual works. Now I came along again and claimed that God sent me. Which should they accept? The noisy ear became quiet and I heard as follows with regard to your question. John the Baptist came before Jesus. You must surely know that cherubim and seraphims are angels, all of whom wait upon and worship our Lord Jesus. The celestial church of Christ is Christ's church, while the cherubim and seraphim belong to the angels and is no more than a forerunner to prepare the way for celestial church of Christ. Whether the world likes it or not, its glory will soon become known to all mankind. As I heard this, I related to Alex. Catholic and other churches were there because the publicity had kindled interest in the answers I would give to the various questions they would put to me. And I myself had no idea how to answer except to transmit the answers given to me. A Catholic said that it was common knowledge that St. Peter and St. Paul took the Catholic Church to Rome, and he knew that it was by the authority of Jesus. Would the same Jesus again send me, as I claimed there then? Which should they follow? As he spoke, my ears went into action. The noisy one gave out its high-pitched noise, while the quiet one listened. I then heard as follows, Young man, we gave you one cobble to hold to, and you held on to it. Now we are telling you to reject the one cobble and accept two cobble, because the glory of two cobble is more than that of one cobble. But if you refuse to relinquish one cobble in time, when in future you come to see the glory of two cobble, you will want to retrace your steps and embrace it. But it will be too late, as others will have taken your place." I answered as I was instructed, and so on for subsequent questions left and right. We left the gathering that day glorifying God. Also, as a result of the success of the meeting, many more people began to join me. That marked the beginning of the church and its growth. Now I was born a Methodist, and I wish to speak about the visit of Reverend Parinder, a Methodist pastor who had been transferred from Porto Novo, where I was under him, to an institute in Ibadan. He was a tall man. He heard about me and came to see me. The church was about three months old then. 
He asked me why it was, since I was a Methodist, I did not deploy the spiritual power that had just been bestowed upon me for use within the Methodist fold. I replied that his point was well taken. But the Methodist pastor in Porto Novo at the time, named Beyond Bay, was the one who went on the pulpit and preached that no Methodist should come to my house because I had acquired magical powers by purchase and was deceiving people about. This turned many Methodists against me, and they did not come near me. Moreover, my dear reverend, I continued, if the Methodist pastor at the time had sent word to me to inquire truthfully and diligently about me, don't you think I would quite gladly have joined forces with the Methodist church because I myself had no understanding of the whole episode, as shown in the fact that I sent to the police to help to send multitudes away from my house. However, before you came, I continued, he who sent me told me that a European will be coming to see me and that I should speak with him patiently and calmly. I was then asked to tell you that you should stay a while until next Sunday and worship with them at the Methodist Church in Porto Novo. After service, position yourself at the exit with one half of the door closed so that they can also shake your hand as they file out. Note their fingers for any rings which are not engagement or wedding rings, and which are made of metal or such like. You should know for sure that in such people's homes are to be found idols, witches and other powers of darkness, and that they are idol worshippers. It is they who use the powers of magic, and those who would truly worship and serve him must serve no other god. The message given to me is that many Christians there are who on their death do not see Christ because they had become idol worshippers before their death. This is the task entrusted to me. After giving him this message, he stood speechless for some half hour in thought, beating his forehead with a pen, and with one leg crossed over the other. He then went out of the doorway of my father's house, which is where it all started, not my present house stood by his car for another half hour with Adihu, another pastor from Republic of Benin, formerly Diome, who had accompanied him on the visit. After consulting for some time, he promised to come back, but I did not see him before he returned. But according to God's promise, and God never fails to fulfill his promise, at the same time that these things were happening, a woman in Porto Novo called Tenavia from Zevu, district died in hospital after a short illness. The church was barely two months old. Tenavia's younger sister, Mau Loa, interpreted as God will oblige. It was who prophesied that Tenavia's dead body should be brought to me and that Jesus would raise her from the dead. Church members in the area came to tell me of her death and I asked them to bring her dead body to my house. When it was brought on a stretcher, I told them to put it on the bare floor. Now all my relations in our compound were all Muslims. Only my father was a Christian, but we were all Yoruba. We have eight marks on our cheeks. According to Yoruba tradition, when the dead body was brought in, my relations, who were all Muslims, exclaimed in Muslim fashion, La 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 la. What has this boy done again? Brought in a corpse? But I asked them to leave the dead body on the floor. In short, Jesus Christ, my Savior, raised Tenavia from the dead. She became alive, and I asked that she be taken to the hospital to greet the doctor who had treated and certified her dead. The doctor's name was Alexander. When the doctor saw her alive, he ran slamming the door, thinking that a dead person was about to speak to him. He did not realize that it is God the King who brings the dead to life again. It was also Maulo who, at the first seaside Christmas festival, gave the song in Yoruba. Jesu, emiyosinyo, nibimimoyi, lari John lare, emiyosinyo, titi dokpin, emiyomu bukunrele, meaning in English, Jesus, I shall worship thee in this holy place, amidst thy large church. I shall worship thee until the end. I shall go with blessings from thee. Jesus, I shall worship thee in this holy place, amidst thy large church. 
I shall worship thee until the end. I shall go with blessings from thee. Another miracle related to a friend of mine, Moises Suru Afoya, from Zevu district of Porto Novo, who died. His relations came to tell me that my friend had died and that they had come to buy the coffin with which to bury him. But I'd merely called to let me know. I went to the house of Moise and I saw his dead body lying on the floor. He was my friend. I was wearing three sets of clothes. I took one off, covered the dead body with it, and told everybody to leave the room. When it was the wish of Jesus, Moises Suru was brought back to life at 12 midnight. I went back the following day. Moise Suru said he very much wished to tell me what happened. He said he saw an old man with hair and beard all white standing on the balcony of a story building. The old man brought me to show him Moise and asked him whether he knew me. He said he replied that he did. The old man then told him that he, Moise, was already dead, but because of and to honor me, pastor, he would be returned to life. And moreover, he, Moise, would not die again until the person, pastor, who raised him from the dead shall have built a story building. It was thus Moises Suru who foretold the event of my building a story house. And yet, at this time, I did not even have the financial strength to buy a single brick. I went along with it because I knew that my God's word never fails. I am thankful to God that Moises Suru and his children are still alive today, and the story building has been built in his lifetime as he foretold. The next notable event was at the town of Grand Popo where the sea had overflowed its banks, thus constituting a serious problem. Because of the news reaching him of various miracles wrought by Christ through me, the chief of the town sent word to me in Porto Novo that the sea had penetrated the town and had destroyed all their houses. He sent word that they believed that God had sent me and that there was nothing that God could not do. He implored me to come and stop the sea washing away their entire township. I prepared to go, taking six people with me, including Wulida Afoshe Yanga, his elder sister Silvestine, Yaman, and Lida Matthias from Danu. When we got to the seafront at Grand Popo, I saw a European Catholic Reverend Father carrying a curved shepherd's staff standing by the sea. And the sea pushed him back as he prayed with the staff. But when I got there, I was told by him that sent me that to him the entire world was like an egg. And that similarly the sea was like a needle. I was further instructed that I should therefore insert a needle in an egg in full view of the inhabitants of Grand Popo. And throw the egg with the needle into the sea which would carry it away. I did as I was instructed, as it was not my wish, but that of him that sent me. A miracle happened. The sea receded completely. It was noteworthy to record a further development of this event. There was a lagoon in the town, Grand Popo, which normally emptied into the sea. The point of entry was dangerous, as many boats had been carried away there. The sea had now receded so much that the whole area at the point of entry of the lagoon to the sea was dry. When the idol worshippers in the town who did not accept Jesus Christ saw what happened, they became annoyed and protested that the recession of the sea had gone too far. They brought cows to offer a sacrifice and dragged them along until they threw them in the sea. Because of this faithless act, the sea returned with doubled fury after three months and did more havoc than before. The fame of these deeds spread far and wide. Consequently, people in Tofin rushed to join the church. From Agonge, the church spread to Beko, from Beko to Gogbo. As the church spread far and wide, the Catholics in Porto Novo, the Muslims and the Methodists began to plot and mobilize against me. They all had informants in my house. The Catholics had theirs, the Methodists had theirs, and the Muslims also had theirs. Any Catholics who worshipped in my house were immediately informed upon by the Catholic agents. Any Methodists who worshipped in my house were immediately informed upon by Methodist agents. Similarly, any Muslim who worshipped in my house 
were immediately informed upon by the Muslim agents. Consequently, I moved to Weme, a district of Tofin, entry into Nigeria. When my detractors did not see me in Porto Novo, they imagined that the church was reducing in strength, but the opposite was happening among the few I left behind. Meanwhile, some of the members in Tofin established another branch in Gwaji, from where it spread to Lagos in Nigeria. Those who introduced the church into Lagos were fishermen, about seven in number, people like the present leader Samuel Francois, the present senior leader Leon, who is right here among us, people like Johanna from Gwaji, and the late Seppo. Their unique church and spiritual works, which people in Lagos noticed about them, led to persistent demand to see me. I was then already back in Porto Novo, where the church had then grown and become big and firmly established. When word came that Lagos wished to see me, I feared to go either to Lagos or indeed anywhere in Nigeria. Being the only surviving male of my father, I feared for Nigeria, which I understood was a fast and difficult country. The emissary from Lagos was always Moses Ajovi from Ijofi, Nigeria, now a senior leader. After refusing twice to go to Lagos, I relented the third time on the understanding that Moses Ajovi would be with me always. And so we both traveled to Lagos together during the Passion Week in 1951. Soon after my arrival here in Lagos, I learned of a young woman who was mad and laid up in a room. I went to see her and Jesus cured her instantaneously. This caused a stir. Monday, Thursday, word had gone round of this famous miracle. A number of clergymen from various churches sent for me to meet them on the Good Friday in a hall in Yaba, which had a piano in one corner. They told me that they had heard stories of miracles of the dead rising and so on. Although they were all Christians, they wished to make it clear that I should consider them to be thorough, going, doubting Thomases. They very much wished to believe that God sent me, but they would not unless they saw miracles performed there right before their eyes. I agreed. I asked them which of them would like to see the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ and to know that God sent me. They all replied that they would. I then selected two women from among them, one married and the other unmarried, and asked them to lie down. I removed two of the clothes I was wearing and placed one each on the two women. After about one hour, nothing happened. I asked them both to get up. The elder one said she seemed to notice something brush past her, but she looked up and saw nothing. The other said she felt something about to happen to her, but she saw nothing. At this stage, they began to think they would not see any miracles. I then remembered and sang the song which the 11-month-old child of Marie Zevenu gave the world through the Holy Spirit some time before, which runs thus. Meaning in English, Holy Ghost, descend thou upon us. We wait upon thy coming down. Come, enter us, and give us thy holy strength, the strength with which we shall overcome. Thou never makes a promise without fulfilling it. Do thou remember thy promise. They all began to sing this song with me. Suddenly, as they sang, the Holy Spirit descended upon them. Among them, somebody said, He is my beloved. I sent him. Hear him. Another said, You married woman, you are in your menstrual period. You want to see the glory of Jesus. Do ask her whether or not she is in her period. Still another said, You young woman, you know very well you have just had sexual relations. And you have not bathed to cleanse yourself. I am a selective God. They were all bewildered at all they saw and heard coming from among them. The whole hall shook and they saw the power and glory of God. Now these people at Yaba that day knew many Christian songs of their own denominations. They were so impressed with what they saw that they declared that they would do nothing but sing when they saw Jesus. So they began to have a feast of songs. After some time, I told them it was time to go home. They said I should not go home, and they would not stop singing until daybreak. 
And moreover, they continued, it was raining. And once it started raining in those parts, they said it was a long time stopping. I replied that what they took for raining was indeed part of God's work. It was a special downpour which would stop as soon as I wished to go home. When I saw that they had contributed a lot of money, I told them I wanted no money. One woman among them gave me two shillings, loaves of bread, which I accepted, saying, Jesus said a worker deserves to have his food. I then said I was going, and they said I could not go yet. I peeped out, stretching my hand in the rain. It stopped, and I left. This fresh miracle really startled them and started a rush of people to the church here. That was how the church really started in Nigeria. Next occurred here the miracle of the rising from the dead of Honsu, a seven-year-old boy. He was found in a room clasped to the bosom of an old woman. The body of the boy was forcibly removed from the woman and brought to me in front of the church. As directed by the Holy Spirit, I sprinkled holy water on him, and he rose lip immediately. This caused a sensation. The chief imam of Lagos, who was on his way to dedicate a new mosque, Owoduni Mosque Adiwaya, stopped by, together with his followers, determined to see whether or not the name of Anobi Isa Jesus Christ would work miracles, as had often been claimed. After seeing the miracle happen, he and his followers exclaimed, La ilaha illallah, God is mighty. Shortly after this, the word came of the death of another young woman named Teresa Hompe. She had died early that morning in the fishermen's quarters. Because they could not find a doctor to certify her dead and issue a death certificate, they intended, as was often the case in Makoko at the time, to wait until dark and secretly have her buried. Makoko at the time was largely bush, and this was not difficult. But the Holy Spirit was with me, and I asked for the dead body to be brought to me. The body was carried to me in broad daylight in full view of everybody, but he who sent me was fully behind me. I placed my hand on Teresa, and she instantly rose up. This Teresa is alive today and is a mother of children. This was why the owner of Makoko, the late Ramotu Emmanuel, a Muslim woman, approached me to say that she had a dream that a holy man had just entered Makoko and that if she wished the landed property of Makoko to be hers, she should go and see the man. She told me that I was the man and requested me to pray for her so that Makoko could remain hers, and she wanted to know my terms. She came with her son Raimi, her clerk, and Balogun, her caretaker. I replied that I took nothing. I asked her to bring a single white candle which I used to pray for her. Her prayers were heard. The town of Makoko became her undisputed property. During the third month from then, even though she was a Muslim, she remembered that God had helped her through this church. And so she gave the church the land in which the present church is situated. Because of future possible litigation after her death, she conveyed the property to the church, although it was in my name, and obtained one kobo in payment. It was thus a gift because of the miracles observed. May God bless the family. Ramotu Emmanuel died on 23rd March 1952, Easter Sunday. The miracles performed by our Lord Jesus Christ through me were numerous. I shall now make particular reference to that of the young woman named Ulushola who died and whom Jesus raised from the dead after the third day. A young member of the church who was fond of saying, please say hallelujah with me, and who, for short, was nicknamed Alleluia, came one Sunday morning and reported the death of a woman at 3 p.m. the previous day, a Saturday, in a house which belonged to him. He said that in view of the many miracles performed by Jesus through me right there in Makoko, particularly those of Honsu and Teresa, he felt sure that Olushala could be raised from the dead. He first spoke to me at 10 o'clock on the Sunday morning as service was about to start. Service finished at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and he kept on worrying me, but I still did not answer him, owing to his persistence. However, at 4 o'clock that afternoon, I sent Evangelist Bada, then a leader, with one of my robes to follow the man called Alleluia to the house and put the robe on the dead body and tell the relatives that if and when the body moved, it should be brought to the church. On the way there, Alleluia was to go in front and Evangelist to follow behind. Evangelist returned and reported that he had carried out my instructions. 
At about 5.30 that afternoon, they brought the dead body in a car because they were amazed to see the body actually turn over, although it was still lifeless. I asked that the body be placed in the church vestry for women. Now there was a young man from Ondo who came with them. He belonged to one of the other spiritual churches, but I do not know which. When he saw that we left Olushala's dead body in the vestry for hours without bothering to pray or go near it, but that we went on talking generally, he came to me and counseled that instead of doing nothing, we should pray for the dead body as it was already stinking. I replied that I was not the one going to bring Olushala back to life, that he should be very careful and not go near the dead body. I told him that if he did, he would have to accept responsibility for whatever happened to him but he would not listen. He continued to pace up and down. Finally, at about 12 midnight, he suddenly went to have a look at the dead body. He ran back to me startled and reported that he had seen a man clad in white with his hair parted into two, standing at the head of the corpse. I retorted to him that I warned him not to go near the dead body. He ran away and I went to bed. Olushala's mother also went to bed. I did not bother about the dead body. These miracles are not done with my own power. I am no more than a servant for him that sent me. There was therefore no need for me to go into a bout of prayer or staying up all night or fasting for such or such flagellation. In the morning of the third day of Olushala's death, her mother, watching the hours go by, became restless. At nine o'clock in the morning, she came to me and said in despair that as the body of Olushala was still as dead, stinking and lifeless as ever, and already covered with ants, she should be allowed to take the body home for burial. As she said this, her loincloth fell off her. This aroused my sympathy and I got up and followed her to where the dead body lay. I asked her the name of her daughter and she replied that her name was Olushala. I struck the body and called Olushala and the dead girl, replied, Sir. I struck her again and said, In the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. She immediately got up and walked. She's still here with you. You all know her. A younger sister is Sister Ikbadiola, parents of our Lord Jesus Christ. With regard to our Lord Jesus Christ, Lord of heaven and earth, who sent me, it was time for him to reveal himself in all his power and glory right here in Makoko. This happened in 1954 on the Friday following the Harvest Thanksgiving service for that year, which was the third Harvest Thanksgiving service in Nigeria. For three months previous to his coming, spiritual messages had been pouring out of our prophets to the effect that the Lord himself will soon pay us a visit. Suddenly walking into our midst, and that we should always be prepared to be able to identify him on arrival. At about 3 a.m. on the day of his arrival, I was possessed by the Holy Spirit. And as reported to me later, I continually uttered the following words until about 5.30 a.m., during which time the whole house reportedly shook to its foundation. Jesu, Jesu, Edniti irire dabi irio jo mokiniu, Edniti intiori ekonore tomole, that is, in English, Jesus, Jesus, thou whose eyes are like those of a lion's cub, and from whose fingertips light beams out. This was reported to me later in the morning by Evangelist Bada, then a leader who was sleeping very close to me in the church together with some of the other members. The Lord came as a blind man. He appeared walking towards the church at about 9 a.m. He spoke first to my wife, Christine, and asked her for tobacco. She replied that she had none. Then he asked her for cigarettes, and again she replied that she had none. And then he asked her for cola nuts, to which she replied angrily that she should be left alone, particularly as the three things he asked are forbidden to Celestians. At this point, Yaman, who was nearby, intervened and offered him some money to buy the things he wanted. He then told Yaman to caution her daughter Christine to beware, because the world is delicate. He left them. I was not there. I was in the other house some 50 yards away. I saw a man coming towards me. He was tall and graceful and covered himself with a single piece of white cloth wrapped around his whole body from head to toe. As he approached, 
I saw spiritually a sudden beam of light before him and recognized at once that he was the Lord whose coming had been foretold. I went to meet him. He was blind, the usual black spot being totally absent from the eyeball, which were totally white. I then asked, My Lord, whence comest thou, and where goest thou? He replied, The Son of Man comes from nowhere in particular, nor does he have any destination, but goes wherever the wind guides him. I replied, I thank you, my Lord. I then said, Very well, my Lord. Would you not like to come with thy son into the house? He replied as he walked with me, Art thou not the prophet? You had been given to know me because of your loving kindness. I will come with you to your house. As we walked, I put my hand in my pocket and offered him money as alms. He declined and said, Mine is not money, but love. May it be so for you as well. We walked together, I on the left, he on my right. Now, there was a trench at the time near the entrance of the church to drain away underground water oozing from under the church into the lagoon. As we got to the trench, I said, My Lord, take care here. There's a trench. Let me take your hand so that we can cross safely. He replied, Not at all. Son of man may not have visible eyes, but he has spiritual eyes which see better than yours. Before he had finished, he had smartly crossed the trench ahead of me. We walked along and entered my house together. When we entered, he asked me for water, and I gave him water in a bowl. He asked for sugar. My cocoa was not as developed as it is now. I saw this as an opportunity to please him. He did not accept alms from me, but perhaps I could please him with a whole packet of sugar. I searched through my cocoa for sugar to buy, but there was none. Came back to tell him I could find no sugar. He said the lumps in my room will do. I went into my room and searched, and indeed found seven lumps there and brought them to him. He asked me to put them in the water and said, As from today, let there always be sugar in your house. He stirred the water with his hand, sipped seven times, and gave to me, saying, Men will rush to you with various problems, and went on to tell the various uses to which water could be put. I also sipped seven times and kept the remaining water which I retain till this very moment. He then asked for a cloth large enough to wrap around a dead body. I looked round and could only get a yard of white material from my wife, Christine. I wrapped it with paper, and as I was approaching him from behind, he asked, Could this be enough to cover my whole body from head to toe? I became baffled and was going to return it, but he said, Since you intended it as a gift for me, do not take it away. Leave it and go look for something bigger. Then Evangelist Bada, who was nearby, drew my attention to a new soft white cotton material which was wrapped round the altar for the harvest the previous Sunday. Then our Lord cut in and said, Yes, that will be big enough to wrap round me from head to toe. Whereupon I went into the church, removed it from the altar, folded it, wrapped it in paper, and brought it to him. He said, Yes, this is my own portion, share of this year's harvest. He did not touch it, but asked me to pack it together with the earlier material. Also present at this time was Emmanuel Yansunu, who was a Methodist and had only escorted his brother, Evangelist Nathaniel Yansunu. He spoke many things with me. Among other things, he confirmed all your services of worship in the church are acceptable unto the Father. Tell our members of the celestial church that they should be steadfast in their services of worship because worship will be the ultimate salvation of mankind. The love of money will constitute the downfall of many in their bid to enter the kingdom of God. He said I should fix my eyes on him as much as I could, because I would not have the opportunity again of seeing him as I saw him then and talking to him in this fashion. He said I would surely see him again, but how he could not tell me at that point in time. This referred to the time when I myself would leave this world. He then sought to take leave of us and urged us not to announce his departure. Evangelist Bada, who remained present throughout, then rejoined, Who can fail to see the glory of this sunshine? To which our Lord replied in surprise, What? Then Bada repeated, Father, who can fail to see the glory of this blissful sunshine? Then our Lord chanted, Alleluia, seven times. Evangelist Nathaniel Yansinu from Porto Novo, he was not even leader then, was sleeping in the other room. 
He was paralyzed on one leg, but as soon as he heard us talking in the other room, he woke up and sprang up his leg straightening at the same time. It was recalled that this Nathaniel Yansunu was the son of Moses Yansunu, with whom I stayed when I was at the age of seven. Continuing, he said, he came to talk to me because there was a lot to talk about, but I would have to walk with him a little, just the two of us. We left the house, leaving the others behind. He asked me to bring both cloth parcels I had brought for him. We left the house leaving the others behind. He asked me to bring both cloth parcels I had brought for him. I brought them along. We walked along Church Street in broad daylight, and yet we met not a soul all the way to Makoko Bridge. He talked to me a lot, giving explanations and specific injunctions on a number of matters relating to the church. One of these injunctions was that we should henceforth celebrate Holy Communion at our annual Christmas gathering at Port Novo Beach, and that he himself would be present and partake. Previous to this, we had not celebrated Holy Communion at our Christmas gatherings, which was the seventh in the history of the church. At that time, logs of palm tree were positioned either side of the bridge to retain the road and stop it being washed away by the stream. We stood on the palm tree log to the right and we both faced the west. He then requested me to bring out the clothes and drop them in the mud. I did so. He put his left foot on the cloths while his right foot remained on the log. I remained standing on the log, then with his left foot still remaining on the cloths, which were bubbling under his foot, he said, Son of man, here at the spot we part. Go, and don't look back. I turned round and started to go. After taking three steps, I felt curious to know how he would go. I turned round and could no longer see him. He had disappeared. On the third day, there was an incident concerning a particular woman who professed to be a member of our church, but had secretly been visiting and seeking for help from the powers of darkness, fetish priests, and so on. Apparently, as she was passing by Akmena Cemetery, the white-robed man who had appeared to me here earlier also appeared to her and she was frozen stiff and could not move. She was taken into a house nearby. As this was happening there, it was being prophesied to me here in the church at Makoko that there were those who came to me claiming to be Christians, who were worse than idol worshippers, that one of them had just been caught and would be brought to me. On her arrival, I should inquire from her why any member of the Celestial Church of Christ should still seek help from herbalists and other satanic agents. I should inform her that it was he, Christ, who appeared unto her. True enough, some time later they carried in the woman unconscious, and I put my hand on her. She became conscious and got up. What I was asked to tell her I did, exactly, and she confessed. Another appearance of our Lord Jesus Christ was at the Lagos Bar Beach in 1954 on the occasion of the anointment of some members of the church in Nigeria, amongst whom were Leon. Samuel, and a few others. It is pertinent to mention that Leon and Samuel were the first to be elevated to the rank of leader in the church in Nigeria. Our Lord appeared from the sea, as had happened prior to his first visit to us in Makoko. I was possessed by the Holy Spirit at about 3 a.m. on the day and reportedly prophesied his coming in my sleep. At about midday, while we were on the beach performing the anointment, a boat suddenly appeared lying far out to sea. In the twinkling of an eye, it came within about 200 yards from the beach. The next moment, we saw a man on the beach in a reclining position, wearing a piece of blue loincloth round his waist, reminding one of the one on him in the usual picture of him on the cross. His body showed signs of having come out of the sea. He had by his side a well-worn old Bible wrapped round with a piece of string and a copy of the Quran and some sun-dried crayfish. I knew it was our Lord and I went immediately towards him. He spoke to me, giving me further injunctions and explanations on a number of things. In particular, he directed me not to engage in any form of eye service to anyone. While this was happening, 
A woman wearing a simple apparel moved around him, coming not too close, to look at him with some concern, then moving away again. She did this repeatedly. I knew it was Maria, the gracious mother of our Lord Jesus Christ. It was midday, and the sun was high, and we had sought to assemble under the shade of the trees, which were still on the beach at the time. As I walked towards him, the sand burned my feet. But immediately I got near to him, everything became cool, as if under a shade. After he spoke to me, I returned to the congregation of our members, and disclosed to them that he of whom I had prophesied had arrived, and was reclining up there. Members present rushed towards him, and he spoke to many of them. Notable among them was a particular lady, Mrs. Adedonia de Koya, who was gorgeously dressed in Yoruba attire. When she related her own experience, she told us that our Lord queried why she came naked. This puzzled her. At this juncture, Yaman cut in and pointed out that it was because she was not dressed in her sutana like the others. Some members of other spiritual churches worshipping on the beach that day also saw him and many of them rolled on the sand in spiritual turmoil, digging the sand with their hands and testifying to his identity and presence. Various fishes, whales, and other animals of the sea dipped in and out of the water in salute. We went on with our prayers and all the time I kept an eye on him, continued to see him. We closed our eyes to say the grace. After the grace, we opened our eyes and discovered that he had disappeared. So also had the woman Maria and the boat. Members searched up and down for him, but he was nowhere to be found. The miracles that take place daily are too numerous to mention. Before God and man, prior to 1958, several persons had been raised from the dead. And in 1958 alone, three were raised from the dead. Two in Abelkuta and one in Ibadan. They are all with us here. Glory be to God in heaven. Alleluia. The blind see by the grace of Jesus Christ. Sometimes as many as 18 a day, the dumb speak, the lame walk, the sick, too numerous to count, are healed. The barren become mothers, those who are pregnant but are prevented from giving birth to their children by the powers of this world are released from these powers. One of such you all remember is Nimbe's mother, who is with us here. She was brought to the church. Medical opinion said she was not pregnant, and so did everybody. You all remember what I am talking about. But by the power and glory of our Lord Jesus Christ, it was disclosed that the woman was pregnant. She eventually gave birth to the child, whom we all called Oluambe, that is, God is indeed present. He has now become a young man. Similarly, Mrs. Somori, whose pregnancy was denied by medical opinion, also gave birth to a baby girl named Mojisola. Miracles are indeed an everyday occurrence with us. These testify to the fact that he who sent me and who promised that these miracles will happen through me so that the world may believe that he sent me, that he is still with me. Glory be to his name in heaven. Alleluia. May the celestial church of Christ continue to wax strong. Amen. Supplement by the pastor founder to the history as told above at headquarters Makoko. Pastor Founder was asked at a meeting of the Board of Trustees held on Tuesday, 22nd, May 1979, at the International Headquarters, Celestial Church of Christ, Mission House K2, Lagos State, Federal Republic of Nigeria, to give in greater detail how actually the various aspects of the Church's worship were handed down with the surrounding events. The pastor founder replied in the following paragraphs. A few days after my return to Port Novo from my sojourn in the bush through Agonge, where you will recall Kudiho was raised from the dead by our Lord Jesus Christ through me, word came from my elder sister Elizabeth Oshofa, married to Guton, that her only child and son Emmanuel Mawuyong Guton, who later became our evangelist in Ivory Coast, had died. I was in my praying attire, and I sent word that he was not dead. On my arrival, I found the dead body, and I sent everybody out of the room. The idol worshippers who had earlier been trying to revive him hurriedly left the room, and as I touched him, Jesus raised him, and he immediately received the gift of the Holy Spirit. 
and became the first prophet in Celestial Church of Christ. During the first week in October 1947 and on the fifth day after I received the Divine Order on September 29, 1947, we were gathered together early in the morning when word came to me, I regularly heard voices and still do, that the divine commission I was given was to found a new church, and that I should start it right there in my house. The first song given to us was in Yoruba, En Yara no Christi, Egbe o Rinsoke, Kesi Go o Tiji o Vanso, Eredi Rete Fiwa Ninu i Jomi Moi, Eredi Rete Fiwa Ninu Egben Lai, Ki Maria i Yawa Le Masinwalo, Keni Mimo Rirei Le Masinwalo. We all sang the song together early that morning. Later the same day in the evening, while I was alone in an inner room of my father's house, I heard a voice. I still regularly hear the same voice until now, telling me to go and bring a short strip of wood. I went out and cut a short length of wood from the first tree I saw. Being a carpenter, I planed it neatly and brought it inside. I was then instructed by the voice to put it down somewhere as he, Christ, wished to make a covenant with me, and I was going to be betrothed as a bride of Christ. I then saw a hand which indicated the sign of the cross. I was instructed to use the cut stem of a leaf fetched from outside and purple ink to make the sign of the cross in remembrance of Christ. I was told, this is the symbol of the covenant between you and me. I dipped my finger thrice into the ink we used and was then asked to pray for the most wonderful and unfathomable power of the Holy Spirit. I slept late that night because of visits from heavenly visitors talking to me. Mawiyo, my elder sister's only child, was directed by the Holy Spirit from his father's house about a mile away to my house. He arrived singing in an unknown language, which we seem to have forgotten lately. Yari Gorima, Yari Goriye, Ungoye, Yariya, at the same time translating it into Egu a major language of the Republic of Benin. Translated into English, it reads, O praise ye the Lord, all ye heavenly hosts, the great hour is at hand. He sang the song kneeling down, it was also Mawunyo who that same night gave us an injunction that we should not use wine for Holy Communion, but rather a mixture of pineapple, oranges, and coconut milk. He did a lot of work by way of spiritual messages that night. Mawunyo it was who gave the injunction that we should worship with seven candles, and also took a piece of wood and drew out the shape of the candle holder. In this connection, he also gave us a powerful song which we seem to have forgotten lately. Mawiyo it was who also gave a description of what we should use for collection at services and named it Pajaspa, a metal ringed pouch with a handle and a socket for a candle which should be lit during collection. Mawunyo it was who indicated how in heaven a pot of incense was being swung, accompanied by the following song, Yara Sara, Yara Sa Mata, translated into Yoruba, Eton Fitila Mimola Torunwa. He also that same night gave us that this song should be followed by Yara Ma, He Yara Ma, Yara Ma, Yaman Yara Ma. Translated into Yoruba, Wakalo, Sodo, Ulua, Wakalo, Sodo, Ulua. But he said that before singing this last one, we should build a box, which we should call Mata. At the bottom should be kept the cross and stick, which is the symbol of Christ's covenant with me, topped by candles for use at the altar. Having thus removed our shoes, worn our white sutana or tunic, taking the candles one by one from Mata. 
thus becoming candles used in heaven above, and having lit them in position, we shall wholeheartedly sing the above song and ring the bell to worship. This came much later, and draw near to God, forgetting all about this world, kneeling on our knees and our forehead touching the floor in obeisance to Almighty God and in readiness to commune with Him. Mawuyo did not leave that night until about 2 a.m. Soon after that night, I was in a trance. I was wide awake, and with my eyes closed, I saw myself climbing steps in space towards the sky until I got to the top where I saw a tabletop suspended and knelt on one side of it, while on the other side standing was my Lord and Master, my Creator. He gave me Holy Communion. I ate and drank from his hand. Then all of a sudden the table top dipped, and I realized for the first time that below me was a bottomless space. As I exclaimed in fear, I grew wings which I used to navigate my descent. Following morning, before I had the chance to relate this incident, a woman told me that on her way from the toilet the previous night, she suddenly saw me with wings, while my eyes and body were fiery. She ran, shutting the door, only to see me again in similar fashion, and then she ran to the bed and covered herself in fear, wondering that I was surely not yet dead. I replied by telling her the story of the incident of the previous night. She died within three months of seeing me like that. Injunctions about ringing the bell to worship. This came through me seven years after the birth of the church. You will remember Supreme Evangelist Bada that when I related this incident to the congregation at Makoko, I held a Bible in my hand as witness. I was in a trance and saw in space a house without solid walls or roof, but a house nonetheless. Some were on the upper floor, and we were on the lower floor, both floors not being solid, but suspended in space and real nonetheless. As the bell rang three times, both those on the upper floor and we on the lower floor knelt down, touching our forehead to the floor, and said in Yoruba, Mimo, 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 Siolua, Awomogu, meaning in English, Holy, Holy, holy to the Lord God of hosts. The bell ringing three times and our response was done three times. It was after this that we started the service in my trance. This is how it formed part of our service worship in Celestial Church of Christ. Injunctions about praises facing the four corners of the earth. This came through Joseph Awangonu, Baba Martha. He said that he saw a church without walls or roof, but apparently with four entrances in the four cardinal directions. And as the bell rang, he saw people of all races running into the church from the four corners of the earth. And as they ran, they were singing in Yoruba, En Jesu, En Jesu, Fuin Jokain to Sokale, En Jesu, En Jesu, Fuin Jokain to Sokale. The more the multitudes, the more room the church seemed to have. Songs of entreaty for God's power and glory. Following song came as I was traveling on a boat in mid sea from Igbesu to the spot where I prayed unto God and the tree I had specifically come to destroy burnt for seven days and seven nights. As my boat was about to land, I heard a song which appeared I was singing with others, unknown and unseen, as follows. Baba ni wakati, be isha owa orega, ki gbogba ye lemo, ire lo rami nishe, la son la yeng bogo. Wakati na de ta ye yo wariri, la be agbara mimo jesu. It is a powerful song which should not be sung lightly. Injunctions for monthly watch night service. During a service in remembrance of our Lord Jesus Christ's prayer at Gethsemane shortly before his death, we were told that the following song which came through Mawiyan was the song which our Lord actually sang kneeling and with forehead touching the ground at Gethsemane 
when he besought his disciples to watch while he prayed. In the song, he seeks to draw them into prayer of worship of the Lord, unaware that they have fallen asleep. Yago la mariangarie. Yago la marie. Translated in Yoruba. Efuri balefon baolua. Mofuri balefon. Meaning in English, bow ye before the Lord God. I bow myself before him. That was Jesus speaking. This was the only song Jesus sang in the Garden of Gethsemane that night. As he sang and prayed intently, he sweated so much that the drops of sweat began to fall from his body like blood. And the voice answered our Lord Jesus on that occasion, Thus I have glorified you on earth and in heaven. We sing this song in Celestial Church of Christ during the monthly watch night services and on the first Thursday night slash Friday morning of each month in remembrance of the occasion and also during Easter at the watch night service of Holy Communion on Holy Thursday slash Good Friday. Another song used on the same occasion and which came at another time was Hira Jama Jaribam Hira Jama, translated immediately in Yoruba, so that we can understand the song we are being taught. Emimimo adabaru esokalewai. It is interesting to note that although my father firmly believed that my birth was in answer to his prayers referred to above, none of us, including my father, had any inkling whatever that the nature of service to God, which I would be called, would be such a very important one. In hindsight, the nearest my father came to predicting this important future was on his deathbed, and he called me and prayed thus in Yoruba. Meaning in English, you will be established in money, you will be established in children. Men will serve you. It later proved not merely a prayer but a prophecy because at that particular time I had not had an issue. Registration of the Church Particulars of Registration The Church was duly registered under the Land Perpetual Succession Ordinance Cap 107 on November 24, 1958. A certificate of registration, whose number is 489, was signed by the then Governor-General of the Federation, Sir James Robertson. Miracle Behind Registration It is noteworthy to relate the circumstances of the registration of the Church. The application for the registration under the relevant ordinance was forwarded to the government in 1958 during the colonial era. Initially, the government was not disposed to grant the application, presumably because no spiritual church of African origin had up to then been registered. Churches in Nigeria accorded official recognition at that time were those which had their origins in Europe or America. On being told of the reluctance of the authorities, the pastor remarked that there was no cause for anxiety because he who owned the church, our Lord Jesus Christ, would reveal himself to the official concerned. A few days later, the pastor asked the late leader, Owaje, to check on the application. When he got there, he had a pleasant surprise in that the certificate of registration signed and sealed had been waiting for him for a few days. He was also informed that the then Governor General Sir James Robertson had related that in his dream a tall white man with long hair parted in the middle and robed in white appeared to him and instructed him to sign the Certificate of Registration of Celestial Church of Christ because the church was his. The following morning he signed the certificate. This was the miracle of the registration. It is hereby emphasized for note that the name of the church, the tenets and mode of worship of the church, and the service hymns of the church are all revealed through the Holy Spirit, as promised by our Lord Jesus Christ. See John 14, 25, 26.
thus, these things have I spoken unto you. Being yet present with you, but the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things, bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you.